A very warm welcome to all of you this morning to St. Margaret's Church and to this service where we come to say our last farewell to Lorraine. We come to, first of all, give thanks to God for her life, to remember her with gratitude, with affection, with love for the person that she was and for the part which she played in your lives and the lives of many other people, to give thanks to God for her, for the person she was. Secondly, we come to commend her into God's care. We come here in this place of Christian worship to recognize that death is not the end, but simply a thing we have to pass through in order to reach eternal life. We commend her then into the hands of God who created her, who loves her, and will continue to love her. And then thirdly, we come to ask for God's help, strength, and comfort for you, her family and friends, and for all those who feel the sadness and pain of her loss. I'm very grateful to the whole family today for the various different types of input that have gone into the creating of this service. You've seen all the photos that have been uh, going around. I'm very grateful for that presentation. And we've also had discussions about the content of the rest of the service. And various of you are going to be taking part as we go through going to uh, proceed now to listen to um, How Great Thou Art, a very uplifting, wonderful hymn of great praise to God who created all that is. Unfortunately, we meet under COVID circumstances which prevent us from singing. We have to listen to the singing rather than join in. But if you want to hum to yourself behind your mask, then please do. I'm not going to come around and listen and stop you. Um, I'm grateful to you for wearing your masks as well. Uh, we, we do, again because of government requirements, have to wear our masks throughout the length of the service unless you're up here speaking, in which case you can remove it. So, uh, provided the technology will work for me, we are going to listen and watch uh, How Great Thou Art.
I'm going to listen to a few words about Lorraine now, reflections from her family. I'm going to begin by reading on behalf of Kevin his own thoughts, his own reflections today. This is simply entitled, Mum. You were our special mum, granny, ma, and mother-in-law. You were there for us all when we came to chat about our days. You always had something to say that would make us laugh. And laugh we all did so much that the neighbors would always comment about our laughter. As a mum to your three kids, you were and always will be a perfect example of what a mother should be and of what a wife should be. As a mother-in-law, you were sometimes tough to live with, as Charmaine always found your shoes very big, size five versus size eight, to walk in as Mrs. Graney. Your role as Granny, Ma, was your best role, the one you loved and lived for, spoiling your grandchildren with cakes and cookies, all home-baked. Your cuddles and hugs with them were the most important part of your life. You and Dad lived with us for 16 years, and now that you have both left us, we can feel the void left in our home. You both will be missed by us all. You were our special light in life, and now that you have moved on, we are left with wonderful memories that we will cherish together. Thank you, Kevin. I'm going to ask Glenda, Enrico, and Nuncio to all come and speak. Firstly, hello, and thank you for coming. <laughs> Sorry, I just need to breathe. Okay. We gathered here today to not only share our pain and sorrow at the passing of our mum, Lorraine Graney, but to also share in the joy she brought to our lives. Hopefully by sharing all the joy, it will lessen our pain. Our mum was a daughter, a sister, a niece, a cousin, an auntie, a wife, a mother, and a grandmother. The latter brought her great joy. Mum was known by many names. Mine for her was Mumsy or Old Duck. <laughs> Old Duck was the nickname we had for her mum, my gran. And that came from a private joke that her, my dad, and I shared. And on the passing of my grand, my mum inherited the nickname Old Duck. So with her passing, I guess I'm now the new Old Duck. Uh, my mum and I didn't always get on, as many of you will know. We really saw eye to eye, but we had our own special understanding and we loved each other in our own way. And in spite of our differences, I have quite a few very happy memories with her. One of them is in high school. I had a hamster called Hammy. Mum didn't like him and wouldn't go near him, wouldn't help with the cage, nothing. Kevin, I think, was the only one that helped me if I needed help. In fact, he buried Hammy when he died, am I right? <laughs> um, anyway, to get some peace and quiet, I used to tell everyone I'm had me out this cage and I closed my door and then no one would come disturb me because nobody wanted this hamster anywhere near them. And the one day I did this and just before I decided to put Hammy back in his cage, I went through to the lounge with him in my hand. Mum was sitting in the lounge with her back to the door and I promptly popped Hammy on her shoulder. And to this day I'm not sure who got the bigger fright, her or the poor hamster. And that. Now I have a daughter who has four pet rats <laughs> to contend with. And it's come full circle because I don't like those little things, as cute as they may be from a distance. Um, yeah. I still squeal. The rats understand. Get it. Another memory I have is 
when I had my appendix out, just before our mock matric exams. They called something now, I think. Um, Mum was driving me home from the hospital, and if any of you know how Mum drove, she'd put her foot down and go. And she did just this and hit the nearest speed bump, which caused excruciating pain for somebody who's just had their appendix out. And to this day, Mum and I have laughed about it so much so that when I went to fetch her for the step down after she'd had a hip replacement, I threatened to take her over all the bumps I could find, just as payback. Um, one of the other things I had is I was a waitress many years ago in Seapoint and mum and dad couldn't believe that their clumsy clod of a child who was always falling over her own two feet and breaking things could actually waitress. So one Sunday they drove through to come and see me in action and were absolutely gobsmacked by the fact that I could not trip over my own two feet, never mind carry all these trays of pizzas and glasses of drink to tables without falling over. Mom and Dad had taken many trips together around the country. I think we've seen a few of her on the scooter. They did many of those. Their last long trip together was in 1999. And I remember it because they'd gone to Johannesburg as a family. And I had just gone with Nuncio. We had met eight months before, and we'd gone for his birthday up to Kimberley, which is where he and two days after we arrived in Kimberley, I got a call from mum to say that they're there too. And I was a bit annoyed. I was like, you know, I'm having a holiday here, really? And they came, they came to see the sites themselves. But in actual fact, as they told me that they'd just come to make sure that Nancy wasn't just a psycho who dragged me off into the sunset and they weren't going to see me again. So, but here we are, 23 years later, still going. And then, as you know, one of Ramsey's favorite pastimes was missing. I see Kevin's wearing a jersey. My son's wearing the last one that she knitted for him. She used to push out many of these. She even had a knitting machine at one stage, and she pushed out many a fair isle jersey on that. And I think lots of people ended up with jerseys and that. She knitted cables, which I can't do. Um, in 1992, I bought pure wool and this awesome pattern with cables and yarn. And right up until now, that was the hardest challenge she had in knitting. It took her two years to complete. And if anybody knows how quickly mum knitted, I mean, she'd push a jersey out in a week or two, depending on how big or small you were. If you were a little kitty, I mean, two days and there's your jersey, off you go. Um, I still have this cardigan and quite a few others. My children have been blessed by the granny that knitted for them every winter. Kevin was having the last as he knitted, and I think his mum-in-law is finishing it for him. And I think we'll be treasuring all those last jerseys for a long time to come. Just over four weeks ago, Kevin called me on a Monday to come and help with mum because she wasn't doing well. Just over four weeks ago, Kevin called me on a Monday to come and help with Mum. I never could have imagined that in the next two days we'd be given the sad diagnosis. During the following weeks, we spoke lots and joked. At times it appeared that Mum kept losing track of time. She kept asking what day it was. We put this down to the AML, as it can cause confusion. Last time she asked me about the day, the Wednesday before she passed. When she asked, I told her it was almost time to rest and that Dad was waiting for her. She very quickly and clearly said that it was not her time and she must wait. I asked Kevin if there was maybe someone she needed to speak to. And when he said none that he knew of, I suggested it was possibly the anniversary of her father's passing but Kevin didn't think so. After mum passed, it still gnawed at me as to why she said that. 
On having a meeting with Father Andrew here at the church on Tuesday to arrange this service, I decided to pop on up to the memorial garden where both, both mum's parents are interred. Mum took her last breath on the same day as her father before her, just 38 years apart. Mum, you brought us here to St. Margaret's about 45 years ago now. We attended Sunday school and youth here, and it's where we were all confirmed too. I even taught Sunday school after confirmation and said I left the valley after the trick. Like her mum, she enjoyed her church services, and in the last weeks we chatted, like I did with her mother, about her service and hymns. She had me singing to her in the hospital and would lie there with this serene look on her face while I sang. Sadly, we can't sing for her today, but her favorites will be played as she requested. Mumsy, old duck, you are missed and will forever be in our hearts. Thank you, Glenda. Now, Enrico Annunzio. to say about Granny. Got so f***ing tired and a cure was not to be. So he put his arms around her and whispered, come to me. With tearful eyes, we watched her suffer and, slowly, and saw her slowly fade away. Although we loved her dearly, we could not make her stay. A golden heart stopped beating our work in hand put to rest. God broke our hearts to prove to us he only takes the best. Rest in peace, Granny, and rise in glory. G'day all, and thank you very much for allowing me to say a poem myself on such a occasion. The Dash by Linda Ellis. I read of a man who stood to speak at a funeral of a friend. He referred to dates on the tombs, beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of birth and spoke of the following date with tears, but said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time they spent alive on earth, and now only those who love them know what little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we lived and loved, and how we spent our dash. So think about the long and hard are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. To be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that the special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read, with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about how you lived your dash? Thank you very much, everybody. Um, Callum would like to say something.
my dearest Ma, I wish you were here with us, but you were wi but with you. Being up there with Pa and God, at least you have no pain. We will have happy days and we will have sad days, but we will always remember our special moments with you. I hope you enjoy your life in heaven and we all hope to see you one day. I just wanted to say, Ma, I will always love you forever. You will be with me, Ma. God bless you for all you have done for me. I'm so grateful. I will always have good memories of you if I keep Tash Tash the toy dog with me. God bless. Enjoy your life, Ma. Hope you enjoy seeing Pa Max Tia Tash Tash. Lots of love from Callum. Thank you to all of you. We, we haven't finished yet because we're now going to listen to a musical tribute from Callum. Uh, he's, play, he's a very good pianist and we're going to listen to his piano playing now. Beautiful. Thank you, Callum. It's very special. I'm going to read to you now uh, part of St. John's Gospel. It's quite a long reading. It's about a man named Lazarus who died and his two sisters, Martha and Mary. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you, you were going back there? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees by this world's light. It is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, 
Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad, glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than three kilometers from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there for days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Quite a long passage of scripture to take in, but it's important to read all of it to get the whole story. We start off in the village of Bethany, at the home of two sisters, Mary and Martha, and their brother Lazarus. Lazarus is sick. 
This is the same home and the same two sisters, Mary and Martha, who Jesus had visited before. There is an earlier account, earlier in the Gospels, of that visit. When Jesus went to visit those two sisters, it wasn't because of any crisis, it's that he wanted to spend time with them. And the Gospel account of that tells us that when he was in their home, Martha was the one who spent all her time doing all the preparations that you would normally expect to be expected to make for a guest, dealing with food, dealing with all the things that hospitality required. She was busy bustling around, making sure everything was seen to. Whereas her sister, her sister Mary didn't do any of that. She didn't lift a finger. She sat at Jesus' feet, listening to him and enjoying being in his company. Martha came to complain. She said to Jesus, Lord, can't you see? I'm doing all the work here, and look at her. She's not doing a thing. Tell her to help me. But Jesus commended Mary, and so told Martha not to be so busy. Don't get so flustered about things. Mary is coming to listen to me, and that's what's important for her just now. In that story, we get a glimpse of two sisters Two sisters who obviously had very different temperaments. Martha, the one who was always busy, making sure everything was done that needed to be done. You can imagine her, the sort of person who makes lists, uh, a to-do list. You have to tick things off one by one. Whereas Mary was far more of a dreamy sort who just swooned around and just took things as they came. You know the different types of personality. So they were, they were quite different despite being sisters. But in the passage of scripture we've just read, what united them more than anything, the fact that their brother had died and they needed Jesus to be there. When they called Jesus initially, it was in the hope that he would come and heal their brother. Their brother Lazarus was sick. They wanted him to come, heal him, as he had healed many people before. That didn't happen. By the time Jesus arrived there, Lazarus had died. He'd already been dead four days. So when, first of all, Martha went out to meet Jesus on his arrival, her words to him were all like an accusation. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, where were you when we needed you? Where were you? We wanted you to come. We wanted you to avert this terrible thing that's happened. But you didn't come. And slightly later, Mary went out. She met Jesus as well and said exactly the same thing. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Two sisters, two very different temperaments, but united in grief and united in knowing that Jesus can do something to help. What Jesus went on to do was something that they couldn't even begin to have expected, which was to raise their brother Lazarus from the dead. The story went on to the point where Jesus asked for the tomb to be opened, the stone to be rolled away, and he called out to the dead Lazarus, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus came out. And Jesus' command was, take off the grave clothes, let him go. In other words, let him be free from death. Let death not hold on to him anymore. Jesus had promised the two sisters that that's what he would do. He said to them, he said to Martha, your brother will rise again. Martha knew that there was a general promise of resurrection. The Jewish belief, well, amongst many Jews anyway, was that when the end of the world would come, there would be a general resurrection. The last day would come and God would intervene and all the dead would rise. So she knew of that promise. But Jesus didn't mean that. He meant here and now. As you watch, your brother will rise again. But he made another promise, not just to her, but to everybody who has come after her. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. If anyone believes in me, even though they die, they will live. And whoever believes in me will never die. What a promise. What a ridiculous sounding thing to say. How can he say that somebody will never die, whatever they believe, 
We know that everybody one day will die. Of course, we can't avoid that. We can try and put it off as long as we can, but we can't avoid it forever. So what is Jesus saying? Is he talking nonsense? Well, of course, he's not talking nonsense. What Jesus did not promise was that we would cling to this life forever, getting older and older, more and more frail. That's not a promise that I would want to hear. Uh, that doesn't bring any joy to me, the idea of me being 150 and not being able to move from my chair and whatever. No, there's no joy in that. And thankfully, that's not what Jesus promises. There will come a time when we have to let go of this earthly life. There comes a right time for each person. His promise is that when that time does come, that will not be the end of us. He promises that death is a gateway we can pass through, and that when this earthly life does come to an end, we will live forever with him. We can't begin to understand that. It's difficult even to imagine how that can be. We call it heaven, but we don't quite what that means all we can say with any certainty is that we are with him that is a promise worth hanging on to and Jesus made that promise to anybody who's willing to believe and trust in him we are here today because of that promise we are here not simply to look back and to mourn at the loss of Lorraine we are here to ask him to look after her now, to give her new life now. And we can ask that with confidence because Jesus himself died and rose again. He proved in himself that his words were not just wishful thinking, not just empty words, meaningless words, but could be trusted because he himself died on the day we now call Good Friday. And then two days later, the day we now call Easter Day, his tomb was found to be empty. He rose from the dead. And so we can trust his promises that we too can rise with him. Today then is a day of sadness, but not a day of despair. Today is a day of hope, a day of thankfulness, a day of confidence, where we entrust Lorraine to God's safekeeping, praying that Jesus' promise of new life will be true for her and one day for us. As Callum said in his lovely tribute, we look forward to being with our loved ones once again when that time comes for us. In the meantime, we ask Jesus to be with us, to bring comfort when we are sad, to heal the wounds which have occurred in the past and the wound of bereavement especially. We ask for healing, for strength, for comfort, for guidance, as we look ahead to the future with confidence, thankful for what has been, but knowing that we can still look ahead with joy. So we say this one thing, Lorraine, may you rest in peace, but may you also rise in glory. And may we be reunited with you and with all those whom we have loved, but now no longer see. Amen. I'm very grateful to Father Errol Sadler for being here today. He has known Lorraine and the family for a long time, and he is now going to lead us in prayer. As Father Andrew said, I've known the Grainy family for many, many years, both here at St. Margaret's and 
in their home. And a couple of weeks back, I had the phone call while I was in checkers from Kevin saying, Errol, mom is not well, and I'm taking her through to Constantiaburg. So I said, would you like me to come in and see her before she goes to hospital? And the answer was, no, I'll let you know what happens at hospital. Anyway, to cut a long story short, um, Kevin phoned me a couple of days later and he said, will you come and see mom? Which I duly did. I asked Lorraine if I'd like to be anointed for healing. And her answer was, yes, please. And so I did just that. I anointed her for healing and laid hands on her. You may be asking, how can he be talking about anointing for healing and yet Lorraine has died? My dear friends, let us just remember that death is the ultimate healing. All the pain and troubles that Lorraine had towards the end and earlier on in her life are now over. She has been healed. She has been made whole. And so I give thanks to God for that. I also was able with the family to give Lorraine her last communion, as you, you remember. And that was special for all of us who were present. And so Lorraine didn't go from this world without receiving the sacraments of the church. She went with our blessing and God's blessing. And so let us bow our heads in prayer. Let us recall the prayer which Jesus taught us. And he said, you should pray like this, our Father in heaven, help us to honor your name. Set up your kingdom so that everyone on earth will obey you as you are obeyed in heaven. Give us our food for today. Forgive us for doing wrong as we forgive others. And keep us from being tempted and protect us from all evil. Amen. We pray for Lord, eternal God. Life is a fleeting shadow that does not endure. Our years pass quickly. Our days are few and full of trouble. We thank you that Lorraine no longer has to suffer pain nor fear. Grappling with death fighting for life and that for her limitations have all come to an end weakness is overcome and death itself is conquered and as she has passed from our earthly sight we thank you for the years of her presence amongst us and while feel the pain of the parting. We rejoice in the faith that she has gone to be with you, Jared and all the others whom she loved. For in your presence is the fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. 
We pray for our souls, forgiving God. In the face of death, we discover how many things are still left undone, how much might have been done otherwise. And we ask that you redeem our failures, bind up the wounds of past mistakes and any animosity, transform any guilt to active love, and by your forgiveness, make each one of us whole. And so we pray for all those who mourn the passing of Lorraine, for children, grandchildren, for friends, neighbours, for acquaintances. Lord, be gentle with them in their time of grief. Show them the depths of your never-ending love and a glimpse of the kingdom of heaven. For by your Son, Jesus Christ, his dying has destroyed our death, and by his rising, he has restored our life. Your Holy Com Spirit, our Comforter, speaks to each one of us in groans too deep for words to hear. So come alongside each one of us and remind us of your eternal presence and give us your comfort, your peace and your love. And so gracious Lord, Support us all the day long of this troubled life until the shadows lengthen and evening comes and this busy world is hushed. The fever of life is over and our work here on earth is done. Then, Lord, in your mercy, grant us too a safe lodging, a holy rest, and peace at last. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen. As we reflect on all the words that have been spoken and the prayers that have been offered, we're now going to listen to Kira singing Amazing Grace.
Thank you, Keith. As we come to the end of this service, would you please stand as we commend Lorraine into God's care? God, Father, we thank you that you have made each of us in your own image and given us gifts and talents with which to serve you. We thank you for Lorraine, for the years we shared with her, the good we saw in her, the love we received from her. Now give us strength and courage to leave her in your care, confident in your promise of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lorraine, I commend you, my dear sister, to Almighty God, and entrust you to your Creator. May you return to him who formed you from the dust of the earth. May Holy Mary, the angels, and all the saints come to meet you as you go forth from this life. May Christ, who was crucified for you, bring you freedom and peace. May Christ, who died for you, admit you into his garden of paradise. May Christ, the true shepherd, acknowledge you as one of his flock. May he forgive all your sins and set you among those he has chosen. May you see your Redeemer face to face and enjoy the vision of God forever. Amen. May the love of God and the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ console you and gently wipe every tear from your eyes, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you, remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>